Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to Slido, yeah. <laughs> um, we're going to go them through uh, after Matthew. Matthew is a creator of Astro, and he's coming all the way from U.S. Kentucky. Um, oh, no. Now I should... What? Figure out something fun to say here <laughs> oh, while thought, you're setting you it up. up I spent all my words. Oh, you made the joke about chicken. You can, yeah, you can say I that. Mean, yeah. <laughs> Who else? Horse I racing mean, in Kentucky. You know about the Kentucky Derby, right? No. You don't know about the no, Kentucky Derby? No, I mean, the oh, okay. only thing I can think about Kentucky is the chicken. I don't know if, <laughs> if, if it's just me, but, you know. The chicken is good. <laughs> uh, let me get this over. Well, Matthew will share more about himself and his work at Astro. Um, let's give stage to Matthew. All right, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm here to talk to you about Astro today. Um, the title, or the, the talk is titled, Bringing React to Your Content Sites with Astro. I have to admit, there's not a lot of React in this talk, though. Um, this is mostly about Astro, but React, just like with, with Capri, um, React is one of the frameworks you can use in Astro, and a lot of people do. Um, so Astro was born a static site generator. It does a little bit more than that today, uh, but that really is kind of the root of the project, and it's you know, how we tend to think about things uh, even now. Uh, this talk is mostly focused on the improvements we've made in the last six months or so. Uh, so if, you weren't, if you're not already familiar with Astro, I'm going to go over it a little bit here in the beginning. Uh, but, but after that, I'm really going to talk about the ways that we've tried to enhance the content story in Astro and, and make managing your content much easier. All right, a little bit about me first. Like she said, I'm from Kentucky, uh, the United States. I'm one of the co-creators of Astro. Uh, I'm also the manager and, and slash engineer on the platform team. We're the team that work on the open source part. I work for the Astro technology company. Uh, so we, we actually build a company around the project to, to help support it. A uh, few hobbies, since you know I'm a, I'm a person, not just an engineer. A uh, couple hobby, hobbies here. I, I, I like art. I like doing watercolor, paper mache. Uh, I can't say I'm particularly good, but I do, I do like doing those things. Uh, I love just hanging out in my backyard. I have a, a fan, hanging out with my dog. It's my, my favorite place to be. And I'm a big fan of Pac-Man or just like 80s arcades in general. Um, come talk to me about that if you're into that too. I uh, also have to say that Astro loves the Nordic region and Nordic companies. Uh, here's a comp couple of companies that have used Astro. I don't know if you've heard of these before. They're kind of up-and-coming companies, but hopefully, hopefully they'll catch on. Um, no, uh, Lego, I believe, I'm not sure if Lego has deployed anything with Astro, but I know they've experimented a lot with using it. Uh, and IKEA, has, they, they use Astro in very creative ways uh, that I can't really get into here. I don't know of any Finnish companies. So if, if someone knows of a Finnish company that uses Astro, please let me know. I'd love to add it to the slide. Uh, also, we were in Copenhagen just a couple months ago. Uh, so we did a, a, a meetup at Lego uh, there recently. So yeah, big fan uh, of, of the Nordic region uh, with Astro. All right, I'm going to go through just kind of a quick speed run into what Astro is, just in case you know, people are not aware. Um, I guess the easiest way to explain it is everything that, that Felix said in his talk, like Astro kind of is very similar to that. Uh, we practice partial hydration. Uh, we support all the frameworks. Uh, very similar projects, actually. Um, so we say, I say that um, Astro is a not just static site builder. I mean, it is a static site builder. We added support for SSR, meaning you can run Astro on your servers. Uh, we added that about a year ago, uh, but we did start out just doing static sites um, and even going, when we went with SSR, we tend to think in static first. Um, it's kind of the core of who we are. Uh, so anytime you build a site with Astro, you can start out just doing a static site and then later you could say, oh, I really need this API route to like save a form, a contact form or something like that and you can toggle on SSR. Um, and there's also ways to do both at the same time. You can have a site that's mostly static and then a couple pages which are rendered on the server. So I think it's something that us developers really enjoy static sites, right? Because you know, I, I know personally I have a lot of sites that I built years ago and they're static and they're, they're, they're out there and as long as I keep paying the bill then they're going to stay alive. So 
I like to say that static is a vibe. It's not just like a technology, but it's like a way of thinking about how you build websites. All right, let's get in, dig into like what, what Astro actually is. Uh, I'm going to skip over a few things because so much of what Felix said applies to Astro as well. Astro is component oriented. That is to say, you build your site by building components. And you build components which, you know, use other components, et cetera. Um, and those could be React components, um, few components, Svelte components, et cetera, uh, solid components. Um, Astro has its own component syntax as well, which I'll, I'll dig into here in a little while. Uh, Astro is content focused. So by that I mean that we're really focused on the use cases that are served by sites that are mostly content. In other words, things like blogs, uh, portfolios, landing pages, marketing pages, that sort of thing. Things not, not, not something where you're interacting in an app-like fashion as much. Although you can do that in Astro as well. Um, with Astro, we like to think about performance as something that the, the developer should not have to think a lot about. Uh, performance should just come with the framework, just come from using Astro. And we start off with a baseline of zero kilobytes of JavaScript, and you can add JavaScript later, in much the same way that you can do in, in Capri, and I'll explain how that works. And we also believe in the ability to like use the tools you already know and love. We didn't want to like make you have to switch over to a new model uh, of building your site. You can mostly use all the things you love. So I feel like every, every presentation needs like a, a slide with a bunch of logos. So here's my slide with a bunch of logos. Uh, popular things like Tailwind, Vue, React. Uh, this is a Deno here. Uh, this story block is a really nice CMS. I, I, Felix mentioned it, and then of course MDX as well. But we have integrations for just about any popular tool you might use on the front end. All right, here's where I was going to talk about Islands architecture, but Felix did such a good job that I feel like I don't really need to. Um, if you got the gist there, that's, it's exactly the same. Islands architecture, partial hydration, you'll hear these words used interchangeably. I like to think about Islands architecture as being like kind of the architecture. It is, this is Islands architecture. Partial hydration is uh, kind of the how. It's how you achieve the Islands architecture. It's, it's more of the technical, technical detail how. All right, so if this sounds familiar, um, this is basically the same thing as React server components. Uh, Dan Abramov, who's like one of the uh, React core team members, he's made the comparison between React server components and uh, islands. Um, I know Ryan here can tell you a lot about how that works, but I don't know so much, but, uh, except to know that they do work very similarly. Um, Brief history of, of Islands architecture. It was coined by Katie Seiler Miller of Etsy. Later, Jason Miller of Preact. Uh, he did a blog post on the idea of Islands architecture in 2020. Um, for a while, not a lot happened. There was thought leaders, you know, doing their thought leader thing and, and talking about it, but not a lot of projects uh, for a little while. But eventually, they started to be some experimentation development. One of them is a project called Microsite by Nate Moore. Nate, Nate actually works for Astro now. And then we started building the project in early 2021. Uh, yeah, and the, the mission was really just to, the ability to build, at the time we were really thinking, we, we, want, to build, we want to build our documentation site, our blogs, and we don't want to have you know, as much JavaScript as you need and, and more like React component oriented stack site generators. All right, so an Astro component looks like this. We have our own component syntax. If you remember from Felix's talk, he talked about, he asked the question, like, well, how do you know what an island is? And so we took a different approach than Felix, and our approach was we have our own component syntax. So we're actually able to know what components you use on your page because, you know, like I said, we have our own, our own format. Um, this can be broken down. Actually, let me show, show the, this one again. This front section up here... We call this the front matter section, and if you're feeling familiar with the term front matter from something like Markdown, it's the part of like metadata you put at the top of your Markdown file. Uh, we kind of stole that idea, except here in this case you can put any TypeScript you want, full TypeScript support. And down below that is the template section. And the template section is basically HTML. We use an actual HTML parser. 
uh, the, the uh, fork of the Go parser to, to, to do this. Um, so it is very JSX-like. You have expressions. We have a title here. You can put any JavaScript or TypeScript you want inside of there, and that works. Uh, but otherwise, it's, it's more similar to HTML. You have things like you don't have to self-close certain tags. Uh, so that's the syntax of what, it, of, of what it looks like. How it works, how we actually do partial hydration is you specify when you add a component if you want it to hydrate in the client. So this client idle is a way of saying, I want this to hydrate in the client, but when the CPU is idle. So in Astro, we have these different uh, client directives. There's client idle, client load, client visible, and, and they all just are a way of telling telling Astro when you want these things to actually load. So you can think about them as kind of a, 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 a different levels of priority. Uh, client idle is kind of a low priority. We're saying that we want this to load, but there might be other stuff that's more important. Go ahead and do that first, and then do this later. All right, we have a lot of other features that you expect. I don't know why that's highlighting. Uh, a lot of other features you would expect from a meta framework, such as file-based routing, if you're familiar with, with Next or you know, 11 other stack site generators. It's exactly the same. We have a pages directory. You, any file in there becomes a route. And then we have a lot of developer conveniences. Uh, we we backed by Vite, um, just like Capri. And so you get the whole Vite roll-up ecosystem, which is fantastic. Uh, we have really good HMR support. Like, even you can modify your Tailwind config, and it will reload. You can modify your, your TypeScript config. Uh, we put a lot of effort into making that experience really well. And then we also have our own ecosystem that, that's rapidly evolving. Here's a link uh, to check that out. And like I said, we support just, in, just about any framework you could use inside of Astro. All right, so that's the, that's the quick version of what Astro is. I'm going to jump into some of the features that we've been working on in the past six months. So, Astro 2.0 was released, I believe, in January, late January, maybe early February. And one of the, the highlight feature of that is what we call content collections. And so what content collections is, is a new way to organize your content in an Astro site. Content, we say that, that content collections give you type safe markdown, and I'll go through how we actually achieve that. So in the traditional, before we had content collections, your content actually lived alongside the rest of your, your routes. Mm -hmm. So you might have an index route, which is like, I don't know, like your marketing page, and then you have some navigational routes. And these are not really content, if you will. But then you also have your blog, and you have it inside of there. Um, so this, this is a perfectly fine way to do it, but it, it, it's kind of limited, because we, you can't really treat your content as a data source doing it this way, because it's the same as any other page. So people ask, they wanted to do things like, well, I want to get a list of all the titles of all, my, of all of the, the blog posts, right? And so we created some APIs for that, uh, but to be honest, they didn't work super well. <laughs> um, they were based on import meta.glob, which, which Felix mentioned, and kind of one problem there is that those, the styles come with it, so you do something like trying to list all your blog posts, and then you accidentally bring in the styles from one of those. Uh, so it's a little bit of a mess. So, we set, up, we set about to fix that problem when we release content collections. And the way we did that is that we have a new top-level folder called source content. And this is new as of 2.0. Uh, any, con any content in this folder has special APIs that you can query the content. Uh, and it also is type-checked, which is a pretty amazing part of it. So yeah, like I said, why, why did we do this? Number one, to make it more queryable. Uh, we're expanding on that even today. I'll, I'll go over that. Uh, we wanted to separate content from presentation. Before, you'd have to, in your markdown file, say, oh, this is the layout I want to use for this markdown file. We thought that was kind of a not ideal scenario. So um, this really makes a nice separation between the two. And it also makes it possible to pull content from CMS, something that we're currently exploring. So we, we, are, we use, oh. Why did that change? Okay, a little bit of a lag. Uh, no, stop. There we go. Okay, schema validation. So, uh, content collections are backed by a schema. So, it, if you've heard of Zod, Zod is a TypeScript library, or it's a yeah TypeScript library for defining schemas. So, what you do is here's an example. You have there's quite a delay. 
There we go. Okay. You define a schema for one of your collections. So a collection is one of the subfolders inside of source content. So we have a blog collection here. And this Z, this is the Zod library. Um, and you say that for the schema, you have a title, which is a string. You have a draft Boolean, which is optional. And you have a published date, which we're transforming. You also have a description. And you can do things here like say, here's the maximum amount of characters for this description, something that, that can matter for SEO reasons. And then when you actually go to define the properties for this in your post, for example, in your blog post, you're going to set the title, publish date, all here. And this needs to match the schema. So what happens? You hit save, and you're going to get an error message like this. And it's going to tell you that description is required. You forgot to put the description in there. So this is really nice, right? Because this, number one, this prevents you from making a mistake. You might publish this, and now it's going to go on your site. It's missing a description. And so when you go to um, share this on social, you're not going to get that nice preview, uh, that sort of thing. This really helps try to prevent that from happening. Um, we also redesigned our error messages as, as of 2.0. I think we did a pretty good job. You see here, there's the description. We also have a link to docs to actually tell you how to use content collections if you're new to it, um, as well as the stack trace. You see down here, this is the part that you actually wrote that was the mistake. OK, so at this point, you've defined your schema. You've written a blog post. Now I want to actually display it. So this is now we're going to go back to the pages, the pages folder. And somewhere inside of there, this is where you actually present your content, right? So we have a certain set of APIs to help with that. Uh, one is git collection. We have this astro colon namespace that we started using. I don't know if you if you all have seen like Node ha now has a Node colon namespace for like all of those built-in modules. This similar idea is that we want to put all of our built-in astro modules uh, in a, in a namespaced place. So git collection is a type safe function. If you start typing git collection, you're going to get a drop down of all, of all the collections in your, that you have, right? Because we, we know about those. Um, and what you're going to get back there is a list of blog posts in this case. Oh, no, didn't have that. Uh, a list of blog posts which you can map over. It's very JSX-like with, with Astro. And post.data, this is all those properties in defining your schema. And they're all the correct type that, you, that you've chosen. And let me go to a video and actually see this happening in action. So we see here, this is a, another API. This is get, I showed get, get collection before. Get entry by slug is how you get a specific entry, like you want to get a specific blog post. And you see here already, we, we are getting, it already knows about blog, and it knows all the names of your blog posts. Okay, and then you call, you get the post back, you call render on that, and what that does is it creates an Astro component that you can then use to render. So this content uh, component, you can drop anywhere within your template that you want, and that's, that's going to be the actual content of your blog post. All right, cool. I've talked about content collections. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. We've expanded on it even since then, but first let me drop down and talk a little bit about images. So after we released content collections, we felt we were trying to think, like, what is the next thing? Like, what is trying to fill out this content story, right? We make it easy to build content websites. Well, images are very important, obviously. And so Astro has had an image component uh, via an integration. There's essentially plugins uh, since 1.0. There is uh, called Astro, at AstroJS slash image. So we've had that for a while, and it, it, worked, it works pretty well. But... Similar to how we were thinking about content, we were thinking, well, images are such an integral part of building content sites. We really need to make this be, you know, part of the core. So we now have this as part of a part of core in 2.1, and a lot of it comes from the old integration, but a lot of it is new as well. And I'll, I'll explain that here in a second. But first off, uh, this is something one of my um, someone else on the core team, Chris said yesterday, he said, images are big and awful, avoid them at all costs. But if you, if you must use one, we got you. Um, 
a, a joke, obviously, but the, the idea here is that like, images have gotten very complicated. Like, I remember when I first started doing web development, like images were just, you know, you put images in a folder, you reference them with the image tag, and that, that's all you had to do, and it's, it seems so simple. But nowadays, expectations have changed, and users have devices of all dimensions. You have, you know, networks that are fast, networks that are slow. And so, and then you have things like, I'll show here in a second, where Google will punish you if you don't do your images very well. And so we want to stick with that, that idea that you can, you know, just drop your images in a folder and then use them. And that's kind of what we try to do with the image component. So we try to have that same goal, the easy way of doing things, but get all the advantages that, that we can give you. Okay, so first up is the image component. Let me get rid of that. Image component is something you import through Astro Assets. Um, use it just like any other component. You also need to import the actual image itself. So what that does is when you import the logo.png, that gives you back a reference to the image, an object. And then we're going to pass that object into image as the source, as well as specify like the width, the height, and the alt text. Alt is actually required in the image component uh, because you know, without alt, you, uh, screen readers won't, aren't able to read what the image is. So I should say just, well, I actually, I'll explain in just a second. We have a secondary API, which you can also use. Um, if you're using, if you're using, this is more, a more level, low level API called get image. This is kind of the secondary API. Um, it works, it takes the same parameters as the image component. You can pass it the height, the width, et cetera. It will do the compression for you and give you back uh, an object, which is a reference. And with an object, you can do things like we're doing here, which is instead of creating an image tag, we're going to create a, some CSS with a background image. Um, another use case here is if you want to use images like within your framework component, like within your React component, you can use Git image to do that. We don't have an image component for React yet anyways, or for Vue or for Svelte, but you can use Git image and, and you get the same, same result. All right, this is what I almost jumped too far ahead of. Um, are people familiar with, well, first off, Core Web Vitals is a new site from Google that will help measure your site. And one of the metrics is, I believe it's called Cumulative Layout Shift. Um, something that I think all web developers are familiar with and have experienced just using the web, but not something I thought about as a, could be a metric, but it's really interesting that it is. Uh, so Cumulative Layout Shift is, measures when a page shifts. So you can, some, for some examples here would be like, you load, a page loads and then an ad inserts and then it jumps, right? Your text jumps down. So one big cause of that will be images. You, you have an image tag, image doesn't load, then the image does load and that the text that the user was reading jumps down and it, it's jarring, right? So I believe, I believe Google search actually factors this, these metrics in now, if, if, if I'm correct. Um, so one big thing you get from Astro Image is that this is taken care of for you, right? Because even if you don't provide a width and a height, we, we get the, the source width and the height, and we add that to the image tag. So just by having the width and the height in your image tag, the browser knows that it needs to take up that amount of space on the page, and so you don't get that shift. All right, so I mentioned that one of the big driving factors in bringing images into core was integrating it more closely. So content collections are, or images are integrated into how content collections work. So going back to like one of our examples uh, that we had before, actually, yeah, no, that's right. Um, you define, you can define a cover image, and this is just a path to the image that you have. And then what you can do in your configuration, in your schema, is we have this helper, it's a Zod helper called image, it's a function, you call that, and that tells Astro that this is an image, right? So why would you want to do that? Well, here's why. When you save, I have all kinds of markup on my thing, don't I? Uh, when you save, you're going to get an error message if that image doesn't exist. So, you know, you write a typo, this says place F holder, there's a typo in, in the name, 
you're getting an error message. It's telling you that that file doesn't exist. So you don't want to accidentally publish your blog post and your images don't show up and then you have an emergency that you have to go fix. All right, we can go a step further with this actually. Oh my gosh. Um, we can go a step further with this and with Zod, it, it has ways to, you can do more than just define the type. Z this is a Zod helper to refine and with that, you, you get back the input and you can validate it. So in this case, we're gonna validate the dimensions of the image because we only want to support images of a certain dimensions. Like, I know that Twitter, for example, is very strict about the dimensions of the images uh, that show up in a tweet. So if you have in incorrect dimensions, you're going to eventually, if this ever slides, go, there we go. You're gonna get an error message when you're with incorrect dimensions as well. So this is just to show that this integration between images and content collections gives you a lot of control over making sure the content that you have on your site is valid, right? All right, lastly, let's talk about how we actually use an image. So similar to, ask to do an Astro content, you have these, these methods to retrieve items from your collection. Get entry by slug is one of those. Uh, in this case, we're getting the slug from the params. Uh, don't, don't worry about this so much, but the idea is that when you define a page, you have a certain parameters, like for example, the name of the blog post is actually in the URL. That's what params.slug is here. So we're getting back the post that the user navigated to, and that post obviously has all of that metadata on it. So it has the post data, uh, or excuse me, post data title, which is part of the schema, but it also has post.data.cover, and that's, that's a reference to the image. And so using the image component, you pass that in, now you're gonna get your optimized image. Okay, great. Um, I've talked about content collection, I've talked about images. Those are the two big new features that we've released, and we've done more updates on that, and I'm gonna go over those here in a minute, but let's take a little break from the big things and talk about some of the small things. So this is just since 2.1, which came out end of March, so basically, the last two months, April, May, uh, we've released all these features. There's 16 in total. And a lot of these are small, but a lot of them are not so small. Um, so this is almost two features a week. We've really been trying to accelerate filling out all the missing features that we didn't have. Uh, one up is MarkDoc. Are people familiar with, with MarkDoc? No, that's okay. Um, if you're familiar with MDX, that's the, the, the best thing to compare it to. Uh, Markdoc is a format, it's like Markdown, Mark, Mark, like MDX. It was created by Stripe to help scale their documentation platform. If you've ever used Stripe's, if you ever used Stripe, you've definitely used their documentation, which is excellent, right? Um, they have a huge collection of documentation and they had trouble scaling it with how they were building it before. I'm not sure what they were using, whether they were using MDX or something else, but they wind up creating their own format called Markdoc and Really, the idea of Markdoc is it's statically analyzable, and so they're able to uh, build it much quicker um, and without some downsides that you get from MDX. Uh, but it's a little bit different syntax. It's, some people don't like it as much, which is understandable. Uh, I'll, I'll show you how it looks here in a second. But you define components via custom tags within the Markdoc. Um, and I'll show you how that works. But the focus of Markdoc is really on scaling and performance and, and not so much on expressiveness. So if you come from using MDX, it might be, might not love it, which is fine. You can still use MDX in Astro, we support it. Uh, but Markdoc is something we wanted to explore to help building like very, very large sites. Um, the major advantage is that Markdoc can be rendered at runtime. It's not dependent on the module loading pipeline. If you think about MDX, MDX allows you to import other modules, it allows you to have JavaScript expressions. Uh, MDX really is just, it's JavaScript that looks like Markdown. And because of that, you need to, all this, when you bundle your site, it has to go inside of there. So it's just an expensive thing to do uh, when you want to have hundreds of thousands of pages. And so this is now supported within content collections in Astro. Uh, this is what a Markdoc Go. Okay, I gotta flip it again. There we go, okay. Uh, this is what a Markdoc file looks like. It is, it is Markdown. 
Uh, this is, if this looks crazy to you, this is like one of the more complex examples you can see. Uh, but I did it to illustrate, you know, all the things you can do. Uh, the, the, when I talked about custom tags, this is a custom tag here, this aside. So is table. Table's built in. But the aside is something you can define yourself. So what we're saying is we want to use the aside here, um, which gets defined like this. We have a configuration file for Markdoc. You can import any component you want. It can be a React component, an, an Astro component, whatever. And then you just associate it with a given tag. And then from there, when you use it in your Markdoc file, it's going to use that component. All right, another small feature here is CDN hosted assets. So CDNs, uh, so when, when you build your, your Astro site, all of your assets get bundled together. Your CSS gets bundled together, like basically on a per page basis. You, same thing for your scripts, the components you use, et cetera. Um, now, in a recent version, we added support for uh, asset prefix. So what you can do is if you want to host your assets not on the same domain as your site, but on another domain, uh, this is typical with like big enterprise companies that you know, everyone, you have to use Akamai for your assets, that sort of thing. Um, if, you have, if you work in such an environment, this is useful there. Uh, we also had support for HTML minification. Um, so with Astro, an Astro template translates pretty closely to what you write is what actually outputs in the HTML. Um, so that means that like all this white space that's here is preserved in Astro template by default. Uh, but that's not necessarily the most efficient way to do it. Um, it'd be better to get rid of it. Um, so now there's an option called Compress HTML, which you can enable, and that will get rid of all the white space. Uh, there's other downsides to getting rid of white space, like scripts might depend on it, uh, but that's, that's a pretty rare thing to do. So for the most part, you can enable this and get smaller, smaller HTML payloads. We also, another performance thing is we added support for parallelized rendering. Um, so Astro is a, the rendering happens in a streaming fashion. Uh, if you're not familiar with HTML streaming, it is, with HTML streaming, you can uh, send partial HTML back to the browser and it will begin displaying that to the user. Uh, so for example, let's say that you needed to retrieve something from the database that's like a very expensive database query, right? Well, you can go ahead and send like the header to the browser if you already have that. You can go ahead and send that part, wait on the database to finish, and then send the rest. And that way the user is able to, number one, they could see something right away, but also all of your scripts and styles start downloading before the rest of the page even finishes. Um, so Astro's always supported that, but the downside of, of the way we did it before was that when you hit any component, those are async boundaries. So in this example, we have an async component which has a delay of, an artificial delay of one second, right? So what used to happen is, here we encounter this, this template, wait one second, then wait one second, and then wait one second, so three total seconds. Um, that doesn't happen anymore, we've changed that. Now these all render in parallel, so instead of being three seconds, this will all happen in one second. And that's because these components are independent, they don't depend on each other, and so we can actually, we can actually run everything in parallel, which is really nice. Uh, another very tiny thing, actually let me skip over this one. Um, I'll briefly talk about this. If you understand this, then you are a CSS expert, in my opinion. Uh, we have stronger support for CSS scoping. So, like in a lot of component-based frameworks, styles are scoped in Astro components. We have an article selector here, which points to this article. And what actually happens when this compiles is we create a class name for this and that gets attached to that article element. And because of that, that prevents any other, it prevents this, these styles from bleeding over to somewhere else, right? Um, but we also use the, the where pseudo selector. Um, if you're familiar with that, that gives you a specificity of zero. And so in some scenarios, when you have a very large site, you have some global styles, everything gets bundled together, your global styles might override your local styles, which is something you probably don't want. Uh, so we add a new, a new way to do style um, scoping. If it will toggle, it will show you. Oh, there we go. I think my internet is slow is the reason. Um, now we basically just get where of the where clause, and now this has a specificity of one. So any global article styles are not going to override this. 
All right, let's go back to images real quick. Um, I've talked about some of the small features that we've released. We've actually been continually working on images uh, throughout the last couple months as well. Uh, first up, we have, now have automatic Mark Doc and MDX support. So when you, in, you write a, an image within your Markdown, this is going to go through the same, um, the, same, the same pipeline as when you use the image component, right? Uh, so that means like this will generate an image tag. It's going to have the width and the height and all of that. Not, you, it's not really pro you can't really use an image component inside of a Markdown file. You could in MDX, but you can in Markdown. Um, so we really needed, to, in order to support it well, we needed to add this. We also have support for relative images. So for historical reasons, this didn't work in the past. I don't want to get into why, but now you can actually do this. And this is important for a lot of people. Uh, you want to co-locate your images along with your blog post. Uh, you can do that now. We also have support for build time caching with images. What will happen is when we go to build your image, you give us the parameters, the width, and the height, the actual underlying image, and we create a hash from all those things, and we save that into a local node modules.cache folder. And then if you go to build the site again, that file already exists. We don't really need to build it again. And this is important because images can be one of the most costly parts of your build process, and it doesn't take very long. You don't have to have that many images before, before that actually outweighs how long just generating the HTML takes. Um, so luckily, most CI environments automatically cache node modules for you. You don't have to do anything. Uh, and because of that, you're going to get a much better performance. We also had support for the Vercel image service. So if you're a Vercel user, they have their own image service, which you can use at runtime when you deploy your app. Um, and that will do dynamic um, image optimizations for you. Um, it also utilizes uh, the Vercel Edge network. So this is very easy to enable. If you're a Vercel user, you just say image service true. Um, you have full control over all the configuration as well. Like if you go to the Vercel docs, they have all types of ways to configure the different sizes you want, that sort of thing. You can do all that here as well. All right, I'm going to jump back to content collections again. Um, as we were building out content collection, we were building out images, we started to realize that Content is not just isolated, right? A blog post is not just by itself, but it relates to other content. And content is a lot more, is similar to data. Um, the data part of the content is just as important as the actual HTML part, right? So we set out to solve a few problems. And here are a couple of use cases. Let's say that you have a blog post which has one or more authors, right? We, and you want to show the author's image. And then you also want to show, re, come on. sometimes I just have to re-trigger, there we go, okay. You also want to show, oh no, you want to show related posts, you want to show, oh excuse me, you want to show all posts by that author. So you want to be able to go to the page for the author and see all of their blog posts. And then lastly, you want to be able to show related posts. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but you go to a blog, you scroll to the bottom, it has links to other related posts. Uh, we want to enable that kind of thing. So we did this, we, we developed something called data collections to enable this. So now when you build out your collections, you can also have collections that are just data. In this, this, exam this example, these are JSON files, right? And so getting back to the example, this is where you could have all of your team members and so when you want to associate a author to a particular person, now you have this a way to do it. Uh, let's just jump to how we actually define it, because I think you all understand where, what we're going with here. Um, the only difference between a data schema is it's specified as type data. Uh, otherwise, it's exactly the same. You have a schema. You say that this data needs to have a name. It's going to have a portfolio, which needs to be a URL. And then you export it just like you do the rest of the collections. And then you're going to get all the same benefits. So here we actually are adding Matthew.json. We're adding the name, the portfolio. Um, and you get the same benefits as you get with content collections. If you forget to put the portfolio, you're going to get an error message. It's going to tell you that that's wrong. When you go to get this collection, it's going to get autocomplete. Um, it's going to be type safe and all that jazz. 
All right, next up, let's talk about relationship between content. Um, like I said before, content is not isolated, but it, you use it with other content. Um, and so we really want to solve this problem. There we go. If you are familiar, if you've ever done database schema, you, you might be familiar with these, these terminologies. You don't need to, don't worry about this. If you, if you don't understand what this means, don't, you don't have to think about this. I just did it for the, the sake of explaining these different examples. Uh, but these are different types of relationships you might have in data modeling. One is the one-to-one -one relationship. That is, for, for example, a blog post with only one author. That's a one-to-one. One-to-many uh, one would be a blog post with many related posts. That's the example I, I explained before. And many-to-many -many would be blog posts that has multiple authors. And the authors also have multiple blog posts that they, they wrote. So that's a many-many relationship. So I say that to illustrate. I want to walk through a couple examples here, how we actually model this in Astro today. So if, oh, excuse me. first up, we have a blog with one author. So we have our author's collection. That's the JSON files I showed you before. Um, there's a schema for that. And then within your, collection, within your blog collection, you have an author's property, and that has a reference. And that reference references back to the collection that it needs to associate with. So in this example, it's the author's collection. Then when you go to define the relationship in your post, you say author Matthew, and that Matthew is associated with Matthew.json in your author's collection. Uh, and again, all the things you get from content collections, if you have a typo, it's going to tell you this thing does not exist, etc. Uh, finally here, when you go to use the data, when you go to use the data, the same way we've seen in the other examples of using content collections, there's this method called get entry. This is how you get like one blog post. I'm getting the welcome post here. And the data.author that we define that relationship for is, is a reference to the collection it belongs to and the ID of the entry. So you can call ent get entry on that as well to get the underlying author. And this is how we're able to display the author's name, their portfolio, if there was an avatar you wanted to show an image for, you could use the image integration to do that. And so you get all of that uh, all integrated together. All right, next up, let's talk about one-to-many relationship. So the example we wanted to achieve here is a blog with related posts. We want to show a list of related posts at the bottom of our blog. So very similar, we have a uh, we have a schema, and related post is a property on the schema. This time it's an array, and because Zod allows you to do that kind of thing. But in the, and each item within that is a reference to one of the blogs. So it's, it's a self-reference in this case. And again, and again, this is all type safe. When you do reference, it's going to know that blog is one of your collections. Okay, then we go to define the relationship. In the actual post, you add the related post front matter property. I don't know. It really doesn't want to work. There we go. Okay, you define a related post in your front matter. You link to the post, oh gosh, you link to the post that you want to associate with. Just as before, you get type checking, et cetera, et cetera. These are all entries within your blog. All right, so getting back to how you use it, you see once again, the same way you get the entry, welcome post, welcome post.data.related post is an array. There's a get entries method, which will get all the entries for that. Now you have all of that, and we can loop over them down here to give our links to the post with the title. So you kind of have filled out that use case. All right, next I was going to talk about Astro 2.6, which just came out on Tuesday. I think I'm going to skip that because there's so many features to talk about, and we're kind of getting low on time, so I don't want to, I don't want to rush through them. But there are really cool stuff. Number one, hybrid rendering. I mentioned that before. But hybrid rendering is a way to have a static by default app where you can opt in to certain routes to be server rendered. Um, that's new in 2.6. 
as well as middleware, if you're familiar with, with backend frameworks that support middleware. Middleware is a way to define some code that runs for every route. So if you want to do something like have authentication, where you run authentication on every single route, you can do that uh, with middleware in 2.6. Um, but I wanted the point of this talk to be about the content story and how we've been focusing on that and, and really trying to develop that out. Um, so I'll just end with a, a few things that we're kind of thinking about still working on. Uh, one is advanced querying of content. Please change. There we go. Advanced querying of content. As you saw from, the, from um, using Astral content, we have git entry, have, we have git collection. These are kind of very generic APIs. You can't do stuff like advanced filtering or joins, those types of things you might want to do. Um, so we're currently thinking about ways to enable that, to basically allow you to do any sort of querying you want to do between your, your, your content. Uh, we're also very interested in view transitions. Are people familiar with this? Um, so a lot of people really want to, to, um, to switch between pages without, without the browser refresh, right? And view transitions are, are a new technology being built into web browsers that enable this. They, enable, they allow you to do uh, animations between page navigations. Um, if you go to this link, you'll see a very cool demo about that. Um, we've been thinking about how to do client-side rendering in Astro for a while. Uh, we really like the view transition story. We think it fits content very well. We don't know exactly what we're going to do with that, but it's something that we um, are, are working on. And then last up, Let's go, let's go. There we go, Astro 3.0. Uh, that will be coming out probably around September, so we still have a few months. Um, a lot of the things I talked about earlier in the talk, HTML compression, um, there's a few other things I didn't talk about, but there are several things that we uh, couldn't, couldn't enable by default in uh, the currently, because they're technically breaking changes. All that stuff will be coming to 3.0 um, here pretty shortly. And we're trying to coordinate with the Vite release cycle Vite releases twice a year, and we're trying to do that as well. All right, that is it. That is the talk, uh, Astro and, and managing your content. So thank you. <laughs>